I'm building the frame mainly from two thicknesses of Baltic birch plywood. I'm starting with three quarter inch. I'll get about half the parts from this one sheet. With the three quarter inch plywood parts all cut out and set aside, I can switch to half inch plywood and cut out those parts. The way I designed this frame is for it to have a box beam on one edge, and that provides the strength that the saw needs to resist bending and twisting. The part that I'm working on right now is the main panel of the frame. It's a single piece of half inch plywood that needs several cutouts that I'm laying out here. And one of the interesting features of this saw is that it has a built in spring for the upper wheel. And it's this narrow strip of plywood that I'm marking out here. Now I'm gonna do the bulk of the straight line cutting on the table saw as much as I can anyway and then finish that up with the jigsaw. And here's a better look at that strip of plywood that I'm gonna be using as a spring that I talked about earlier. With that done, I can move on to drilling the holes, starting with the ones for the bearings. This is actually a counterbore that the bearing will fit in and keep it in place. And to finish it, it needs a smaller hole for the shaft to go through. And I also need to drill smaller holes for T-nuts in three places. The hole that I'm drilling right now is in that strip of plywood spring, and that's for a piece of shaft that the tensioning cam rotates on. With the holes drilled, I can start putting it together, starting with that box beam on the edge. These parts are made from solid hardwood and they act as cleats to fasten other parts too. And the shorter two also act as guides for the tilt and tension assembly. With the bulk of the frame put together, I can fasten it to the base, but I need to mark a line on there first. And while it's drying, I can cut out another part. This is the side panel that goes directly below the table. And I can get that fastened in place as well. I can also get the T-nuts installed, and to do that, I always like to put it in place, mark the holes with the tangs, and then drill those holes out. And to keep the T-nut from coming out again, I'm just going to drive in a small screw. While all that was happening, the glue dried on the base and I can get it tipped over and drive in some two inch screws. The piece that I'm gluing on right now completes the box beam. And once again, I'm using glue and one and a quarter inch brads to hold that in place. Technically at this point, the frame is finished, but I'm gonna continue on and make the parts for the upper wheel assembly, starting with the panel that goes directly behind the upper wheel. This has an oversized elongated hole for the upper wheel axle to go through, and that elongation gives the axle room to move up and down to tension the saw. The part that I'm making now from solid maple is the upper wheel pivot. And what this basically is, is a one inch dowel split down the middle, except I'm doing it on my router table with a half inch round over bit. And you can see that this is sized to fit between those guide bars on the upper part of the frame. I also need to mark and cut it on the backside to make relief cuts to allow it to tilt up and down. The parts that I'm gluing up here will make the axle mounting block for the upper wheel. 
This needs a hole for the axle, of course, and it also needs a smaller hole for the tilt adjustment screw. I got the axle cut to the correct length and I roughed up one end a little bit so that it will grip the glue a little bit better as I glue it into that mounting block. And I also need to glue that pivot pin in place while I'm doing it. While that's drying, I can get the T-nut installed in the axle mounting block. This is for the tracking. This is the short piece of shaft that the tension cam will rotate on. And here you can see how that upper wheel mount fits in the slot and is free to move up and down as well as tilt forwards and back. And now I can move on to making the wheels. And those need to be at least an inch thick, but I don't have any plywood that's thick enough. So I'm going to be making them in two layers. And the first step is to cut out the blanks from half inch plywood. I also need hubs for the wheels, and once again, that'll be half-inch plywood. Next, I can mark the center on those hubs and drill them out for either the bearings that will go in there or the 5 8 inch shaft. I mark the center on the wheel blanks and drill those out with a 5 8 inch bit as well. And the reason why I'm drilling it to that hole size is to make everything easier to line up. That matches the axle shaft for the bottom wheel and also the bearings for the upper wheel fit on a 5 8 inch shaft. And to cut it into a perfect circle, I made a circle guide from just a piece of plywood. It has a 5 8 inch hole on one end for the shaft to fit through as a pivot point, And it also has a 5 8 inch hole on the other end so that the collar that I have on my router will fit in there. With all four of the wheel blanks cut, I can get them glued together in pairs. And I'm using the axle shaft to make sure that they're lined up correctly. This is the lower wheel and I can get the hub glued on as well. To put together the upper wheel, I cut another piece of shaft, a shorter one. And once again, I can get the hub glued on, but this one's different because it has the bearing in there. And you can see that the bearing fits on the shaft and lines up the hub. When I cut out the wheel blanks with the handheld router, that was one way of doing that. But a better way is to actually do it on a router table if you have one. So I'm going to show that now except I'm just going to trim a very small amount off the wheel blanks that I already have because I left them just slightly oversized so that I could do this and show how it's done. While the handheld method is pretty accurate, this is very accurate. So this would be the way to do it if you have the option. I have a tapered laminate trimming bit in my handheld router here and the idea with this is to slightly crown the wheels and that will leave the middle of the wheel higher so that the blade will track towards the center of the wheel. With that done I can try on the tire and see how that fits. These are ones that I bought although you can also use the right size bicycle inner tube instead. These wheels need to be balanced, and to do that, I've got a pair of aluminum rails clamped down to my workbench. I can balance the wheel on the axle to see which side of the wheel is heavier. This can take a while, especially for a material like plywood that has, you know, varying densities throughout. And to get it balanced, you can either take weight away by drilling holes, or you can add weight, and I'm doing that with these three-quarter inch screws. I need to glue the axle into the lower wheel and I'm using polyurethane construction adhesive all over the shaft and I want to make sure that I get the excess scraped off as well. I'm adding a stop collar to the upper wheel axle and then I can slide the wheel on with the bearings and put another stop collar on the outside to keep the wheel on. And here we can look and see if there's any wobble on the upper wheel and this looks good. And I'll try it on the bottom wheel. I got this strip of wood so you can see that there's very little. This is a 3 8 inch bolt that will adjust the tracking. And I need to get a metal plate in there for this to push against. And decided that this would be, you know, the way to do it the hard way. 
rather than doing this before I put it together, I'll do it now where I can't get my fingers in. Well, I'm pretty sure that the glue on its own and the nice tight fit will hold that axle on the lower wheel in place. I figure it won't hurt to add a little bit of insurance with a cross pin. And this is just a number 10 machine screw that I'm gluing in. Now I need to make the back panel for the lower part of the frame and it's a piece of three quarter inch plywood with some holes in there, in particular a hole for the shaft to go through for the lower wheel bearing that will come out the back. And I drilled that hole to one inch and then realized that that wasn't big enough so I had to re-drill it to two inches. And once again I made a plywood spacer to go up against the bearing. I'm going to slide the lower wheel in place. And then I made this alignment tool that will measure where the upper wheel is. And I can compare that to the lower wheel and I can see that my spacer wasn't thick enough. So I made a new one, put that on and put the wheel back. Now I can get the drive pulley on the lower wheel shaft and get the set screw tightened up and then get that panel that I just made screwed in place as well. I've got another bearing hub to make and I'm starting with a small hole right through and I use a one inch bit from one side going about halfway and then drill from the other side with the correct size bit for the bearings that I'm using. And you need to be able to move this block around so that you can adjust the alignment on the lower wheel. So I'm drilling oversized holes for the mounting screws. And I don't have any more of the shiny stop collars left so I'll have to use this old one. What I'm doing here is I'm trying to get the lower wheel lined up. I've cut wooden strips that fit tightly behind the lower wheel and that will position it parallel to the frame while I mark and drill the holes for the bearing block on the back and get that screwed in place. What I'm making here is a cam lever that will actually apply the tension. It's just a piece of half inch plywood cut out into this shape. And it has a 5 8 inch hole that fits on the shaft that I glued in previously. The cam on the lever that I just made presses against a wedge. And because I have some, I'm going to be making mine from this white slippery plastic. This piece is three quarters of an inch thick, so I'm cutting it down to half inch thick to begin with, and then I'm gonna cut it at the correct angle. And the wedge fits into the angle cut on the upper wheel axle mounting block. With that much done, I can get a quarter inch blade on and see how it works. To increase the tension, you loosen the screws, slide the wedge over, and then tighten up the screws again. It looks good with a quarter inch blade. Now I've got a half inch blade I'm gonna put on and try that as well. What I'm doing here is I'm checking how much the frame twists when you tension the blade. I've got a stick that extends down to where the table will be. And when I tension the blade, you can see it moves a very small amount. And I think I can improve that by adding some more structure on the upper part of the frame. The biggest reason for this happening is that there is a lot cut out on the upper part of the frame and it's just half inch plywood and all of that has an effect so I'm going to start on the inside by adding a piece of half inch thick oak and I'll do the same on the outside except this piece is a lot bigger and it extends right over to the edge of the bandsaw. Another problem is the wooden spring that's kind of built into the frame is not stiff enough so I'm going to bulk that up a bit by adding this piece right here. So I need to let the glue dry on that stuff. But in the meantime, I can shift my attention to the lower part of the bandsaw. I want to be able to get the motor on here. And I'm starting by making a permanent mark for the bearing block on the back. I also want to improve the grip that the stop collar has on the shaft by drilling a small hole for the set screw to fit into. Then I can get the belt put on and line up the motor so that I can mark where the bolts need to be to bolt it down to the base. 
Then I can get those drilled and countersunk from the bottom. And then put the bolts in with some hot melt glue to keep them from turning while I tighten the nuts. To put tension on the belt, I'm tapping the motor forward and then tightening up the nuts. And with the motor in place, I can start it for the first time and confirm that it's actually turning the right way. And this looks good. I also gave it a try with the blade on and everything looks really good. After that, I completed the wiring, which really isn't that complicated. I cut a hole in the frame for the switch, wired up the switch and organized the cables on the back. In the meantime, the glue did dry on the parts that I added to the top of the frame. And now I can finish the tensioner. The only thing left is something to hold it in place. Next, I need to work on the trunnions for the table. And I'm making those from three quarter inch plywood and using a very simple jig that works with my trim router to cut the half circle shapes to the right size. And rather than trying to clamp these parts down, I'm using my pin nailer. And because I need three of these, the pins will also allow me to put the part back in exactly the same place so that I can cut the adjustment slot after. I have all three cut out, so I've reset my circle jig to cut the adjustment slot. And I'm doing this with a half inch bit because it's a 3 8 inch bolt that goes through it. The slot starts in a specific place and ends in a specific place, so I made a couple of marks on the plywood that will line up with the pivot block on the circle jig. And with the adjustment slots cut in all three, I can move on to making the cradle for the trunnions. And once again, that'll be three quarter inch plywood that I'm cutting on my miter saw here. And then once again, I can pin those in place, being careful not to put it where I'm gonna be doing the cutting. And with the circle jig for the router fine tuned to exactly the right fit, I can cut all three. So the cradles get attached to the lower part of the frame and I'm using the trunnion by sighting in through that adjustment slot to the hole where the bolt will go to line it up. And then to put together the trunnion itself, I'm gonna do that in the cradle, laying in the first piece, then the second piece. Then I can pin those together and drive in screws from the other side. And the purpose of the trunnion is to keep the blade in the same place so that you don't have a big gap when you tilt the table. This piece of half inch plywood is to keep the trunnion tight up against the frame. Now I can move on to making the table and that once again is three quarter inch plywood. And what I'm doing here is cutting the miter slot. I figured that this would be the best way to do it on the table saw, making a series of cuts until I get to the right width, which is three quarters of an inch. And this is something that I did on my previous bandsaw, the big one, and that's to make it so that a part of the table is removable so that I can access the lower blade guide and also change the blades easily. And to do that here, I'm making two stop cuts and a plunge cut where I wheel the blade up until it cuts all the way through. And then I need to cut a rabbit on the underside for the insert to fit into. So I'm using the trim router with a rabbiting bit. To make the insert, I'm gonna try out my newly finished mini router table. I'm using that same rabbiting bit that I just used on the table to rabbit the edge of the insert. 
to the right depth. And I had to do this in several passes, especially at the end where I really snuck up on a perfect fit. You get it exactly flush on the top. I also need to add cleats to the underside to keep the insert in place. These are just strips of quarter inch plywood that are being held by number five screws. Then I can take the table and line it up where it needs to go on the trunnion and screw it down to the trunnion. So this is actually the first official cut where I cut the slot in the insert for the blade. And even though there aren't any blade guides on here, I thought I would make a wavy cut in one inch thick ash. That looks really good and it felt pretty good too. Next, I can work on the blade guides, starting with the lower one. This is the thrust, and there's not a whole lot to this. It's just a piece of 3 8 inch threaded rod with nuts and washers and a 22 millimeter skate bearing. The part that keeps the blade from going side to side is a little bit more complex. I'm making that from half inch plywood and a block of solid maple that I'm gonna glue on. It gets mounted directly below the thrust bearing and I'm using the holes that I drilled in the wooden block to drill the pilot holes for the screws that will hold it in place. I'm cutting a notch into a piece of aluminum very much like I did with the half inch plywood and this is the clamp that will hold the blocks in place that guide the blade. This clamp is held by a single screw that's offset and I'm going to drill it through the plate and also through the plywood at the same time. And then I need to make that hole in the plywood a little bit bigger so that I can put in the right size T-nut for the bolt that I'll be using. What I'm doing here is I'm sanding that wooden block on one edge so that it slopes down a bit. And that will increase the amount of leverage that the plate has for holding down those guide blocks. And here you can see how that cutout that I have in the table really comes in handy for adjusting these guides. Next, I need to work on the upper blade guide. And there's a lot more to this, starting with the column that moves up and down. I need to cut a notch into the bottom end of this. And it just so happens that I have a bandsaw now that I can use to do that. I also need a recess on the side that's a precise depth but I'm gonna make the first cut on the bandsaw to get rid of the majority of the wood before cleaning it up on the table saw. It also needs a long slot cut in it for the bolt that makes it adjustable and I'm cutting that slot on my router table. Time for a little bit of sanding to get rid of the cut marks from the table saw and also ease over the corners a little bit. And I want to get the sanding done before I move on to the next step, which is mounting the guide rails for this column. And the best way to do this is to use the column itself as a spacer to locate the second guide rail. On the bottom of the column, I need to install a hanger bolt for the thrust bearing bracket. And once again, I'm making the thrust bearing bracket from more solid maple, but it's a relatively small part. And whenever possible, I like to cut small parts from a bigger piece of wood to make the operation a lot more safe. I also need a slot cut in here for that hanger bolt to go through. And if I had my time back, I would have cut this slot while this part was still in the bigger piece of wood. It's a little bit difficult to hold this when the piece is this small. The upper thrust bearing is the same as the lower one, a 22 millimeter skate bearing. And the bolt that I'm using has a countersunk head. So it centers the bearing on the bolt as you tighten it up.
Once again, I'm using the bandsaw itself to make another part for the bandsaw. This is for the lateral guides and I'm making it from solid maple. I need to cut notches in the end of it. This first one is for the blade to fit in. And then this one is for the guide blocks to fit in. The guide blocks are held in place by washers and screws. And I also need a carriage bowl put in so that it can clamp onto the end of the column. And that notch that I cut in the end of the column allows it to move back and forth to adjust it. With that done, I can test it out by doing a little bit of cutting with the quarter inch blade, making some nice tight circles here and it's cutting very cleanly. This is a piece of hard maple that's four and a half inches wide. And I still got the quarter inch blade on here and it's cutting through it without any problems at all. Now I can push the blade guide all the way up and test out the maximum resaw capacity, which is seven and a quarter inches. And I'm using the half inch blade this time. The wood that I'm cutting is solid red oak, so I'm not going easy on it. And for a 12 inch saw, this is pretty good, I think. The last big part to make is the front cover, and I thought it would be the perfect place for me to use the Stepcraft CNC to cut my logo in the top part of the cover. After the cut was made, I gave it a coat of water-based polyurethane so that it would stop the paint that I'm using here from sinking into the wood. And that'll make it look a lot crisper when I sand away the excess paint. There's not a whole lot to the front cover, it's just that piece of plywood, but it also needs a framework behind it, and I'm cutting strips of half-inch plywood to make that from. The power switch is on the frame itself, so this cover closes over it, and I need a hole there so I can turn the saw off and on. I could have used metal hinges here, but I thought I would make a pair of wooden ones. The benefit of these is that you can easily take the front cover off if you need to. Now that I have the front cover done, I can get the upper blade guide done as well. And the blade guide is part of the front cover, but it sits on the upper blade guide so that when you move the blade guide up, the guard moves up as well, and when you lower it, the guard goes down with it. And that's it. The bandsaw is finished and ready to use. I still have some things that I want to do with it, like make a fence and also take care of the dust collection and where I'm going to be mounting the saw. But there'll be more details on that in upcoming videos.